Good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. John's. Um, so glad that you're here with us today for this event. Um, I want to just first introduce myself and tell you a little bit about St. John's, and then I'd love to introduce our speaker for the night. Uh, my name is Sari Atik. I'm the rector here. And um, uh, St. John's is a community, most of you are from here, uh, for, for our visitors. I just want to um, uh, tell you a little bit that we are, we are a church that has four core values. And uh, what we're doing here tonight fits very much within those values. Uh, the first value is a commitment to dynamic and relevant worship. Uh, the second value is a commitment to ongoing personal growth and maturity as individuals. Uh, the third commitment that we have is, here is to build meaningful community. And the fourth commitment is to make a difference in the world. And so we're really excited that uh, tonight's conversation uh, is a part of this uh, um, work that we're doing of learning, growing, and making a difference. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that had a part in making tonight possible. And uh, there are too many names uh, to count. But, uh, but thank you, because it, this took a group effort uh, to make happen. So the Reverend Naim Atik, as some of you know, and maybe others don't, is uh, considered the father of Palestinian liberation theology. He's also the father of me. And so um, <laughs> that's the personal connection there. And I'll tell you a story in a second about that. Um, uh, Naim is the co-founder of Sabil which is um, an ecumenical grassroots liberation theology movement that started in Palestine and has grown now internationally. And uh, you'll hear a little bit later this evening uh, from the executive director of the Friends of Sabil North America uh, and, and ways that you can get plugged in. Um, Naeem is the author and editor of numerous books and he is often referred to as the Desmond Tutu of Palestine. Um, and so um, tonight's conversation is a part of uh, uh, Naeem's book tour, uh, his latest book entitled The Bible, Justice, and the Palestine-Israel Conflict, which you can purchase right here um, and get signed later. So a personal note before I invite uh, uh, Dr. Naeem up. So I uh, am fortunate to have grown up uh, with uh, Naeem as my mentor. And uh, one thing that I'll I've always remembered, and, um, and I want to share with you, uh, that is an extra piece to like, who I am today um, and, and that he was so instrumental in uh, uh, making me the man who I am. But one thing that I want to tell you is that one day I was sitting with my dad. As I kind of grew up, we started take, taking walks together. We'd take walks around the neighborhood, and one time we took a drive uh, and we ended up on the Mount of Olives, and we were looking out. Uh, it was evening, um, the sun was setting, and we were looking out on, the, on Jerusalem. And I was old enough now, I was probably 17, 18, old enough to ask um, my dad some deeper questions about Palestine and about uh, theology. And uh, one thing that he said to me is that peace is not possible without justice. Peace is not possible without justice. But we're called to more than just peace. We're called to reconciliation. And if you want reconciliation, he said, you need to practice justice with mercy. And um, I've held on to that my whole life, that pure justice is, it, justice is an important thing, but pure justice can be a brutal thing. Uh, but justice with mercy is what makes us followers of Christ, and I, um, I, I'd like to invite him to come up now, and if you'll join me as we hear more about justice with mercy and understand and come closer to um, comprehending the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Let's welcome him together. It's a joy to be with you tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Seri, for your introduction. I'm, I'm thankful for Friends of Sabil here in the, in the United States for arranging this book tour. And I'm thankful for the Friends of Sabil in Canada for arranging 
a similar book tour. In fact, I started in Canada uh, two weeks ago, and, um, and I think the Canadians were more merciful to me than the Americans, you know, because of the schedule that they had, you know. But um, so far, it's been good. But I tell you, it's, uh, I am so thankful for the reception that we are receiving both Tariq, uh, John, and myself. And I, I'm sure uh, Sari will be in, introducing them. So it's been, it's been good to, to travel together. Uh, it's a privilege to get to know my friends, my colleagues, also there. What I would like to do tonight is to begin by introducing the book just to stimulate your knowledge, stimulate your thinking, and excite you to buy the book. That's what I, this is what I wanna to try to do. I hope it can happen. And I think we have plenty of books here. Um, but at the same time, what I'd like to do is show a PowerPoint, not very long, or I'm reducing it to a, I hope, a time that you will find that you will not go to sleep. So it's a, a PowerPoint that can help uh, to know what has been happening these days and where we would like to go. Again, trying to stimulate your thinking um, as we continue to work for justice and peace. As I was telling some people today, we've had a number of events so far, uh, many of us are weeping, are sad for what has happened uh, to Jerusalem. We are very sad for what the President of the United States has done. I think it was, uh, it was not done wisely. I don't think he studied the situation carefully. I know from reliable sources that he was inundated with letters from Christian Zionists to move the embassy from, uh, from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and not only Christian Zionists, but obviously Jewish Zionists also. And I just want to report to say to you that there are a good number of Jewish people who do not like this, that are working with us against the move of the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. So it's not only Palestinians who are sad, many Jewish people of conscience are also against what the administration has done. Now, let me turn and with a few words, I would like to introduce my book. This book completes the trilogy of books that I have written on Palestinian theology of liberation. It draws on some of my earlier writings, but it goes further by expanding the research on this topic. The reader will find in this book history, Bible, theology, and politics. And I hope you will pay attention to the politics as you will pay attention to the history. We cannot live without politics. We live in the middle of politics and we have to live our faith in the midst of politics. And so I think, I hope you will find the book stimulating to you. It's clear as already mentioned by Seri, that my focus is on justice, because only the doing of justice, as defined by international law, will guarantee a peace that can prevail and endure. So, what are some of the questions and themes that I address in this short book? What is Palestinian liberation theology? This is one of the most frequent questions I am asked. 
I touch on it throughout the book, but towards the end, I mention 10 basic guidelines that reflect the scope, the breadth of this theology. Another topic I deal with, who are the Palestinians generally, and who are Palestinian Christians specifically. Most people don't know much about the Palestinians. Sometimes when people say, I'm from Palestine, they would say, Pakistan? They don't know. They've never heard of Palestine because most people have um, know about Israel, and Israel has tried to minimize uh, the Palestinian issue and the Palestinian uh, question. Many times when people find out also that I am another myth, I would say, uh, of lack of real knowledge, when people know that I am a Palestinian and I am an Arab, they assume I am a Muslim. And they will ask, they will say, when did you become a Christian? And I think they don't know. They think that we must have been Muslims and then by an American, wonderful American missionary, you know, <laughs> we became Christians. So I have to ask them or remind them where Jesus was born. <laughs> and then, you know, I say, well, look, when did I become Christian? 2,000 years ago. That's when I became a Christian. So we are, you will find in the book, you know, about, more about that. And especially, you will find about the challenges that faced and confronted Palestinian Christians over the last 2,000 years. And that is, I feel, it's fascinating. Uh, if you love history, you're going to be fascinated by the different challenges that we faced. The word Nakba in Arabic means catastrophe. But how many Nakbas, how many catastrophes did we suffer as Palestinians? More than one catastrophe. If you want to find out, you have to buy the book. <laughs> Many people see the Palestine-Israel conflict as extremely complicated. I know people say, I don't want to touch it. It's too complicated. Well, I hope I can try to make it simple. And I will say about how it needs to be resolved. And I think I will be, I will try to help you also with the PowerPoint this evening. The Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, contains various types of material. Some of it is palatable and beneficial for Christians, especially some of the Psalms, not all the Psalms that lends itself to our spiritual health. While others are difficult to understand and are detriment, de detriment to our faith and human morality. Now I know I'm saying things that might be difficult to some of you. How can we handle the moral, religious, and theological discrepancies that we find in the biblical text. I try to give the reader more than one key that can help unlock those dilemmas. Where do we find the climax of Old Testament theology? This is very important. One of the most beautiful stories in the Hebrew Bible that was authored by a very gifted writer is that of Jonah. 
It's found within the, what we call the minor prophets in the Bible. It's a beautiful story. After thousands of years, the story of Jonah has a great religious and theological relevance for our life today. So if you want to have a short summary of Old Testament theology, read the story of Jonah. But if you read it without this book, you're not going to understand it. <laughs> you got to understand it. You got to read the book. The theology of Jonah is amazing. Amazing. The, the Bible does not contain a solution to the political conflict, the conflict over Palestine. Now, I know some Christian Zionists think that the Bible has all the answers and that the, resolu the res re resolution of the conflict is found in the Bible. I don't think so. But I believe the Bible can inspire us to find the solution. The Bible can inspire us to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. That's why we need to study the Bible, because it can inspire us to do what is just. You know, our conflict over Palestine could have been resolved long ago had it not been for the Israeli government's disregard of international law and its persistent impunity. At the same time, it is important to remember that Israel would not have committed all those violations without the financial, military, and political support and backing of the United States. What about the city of Jerusalem? We have just witnessed what President Trump has done. His declaration that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel has exacerbated the problem rather than resolved it. Consequently, since his declaration, thousands literally thousands of Palestinians have been killed and wounded because they were defending their right of, for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, my friends, is equally holy, equally special to the three monotheistic religions. And what the president did was a blunder because he just gave Jerusalem on a silver platter to one religion, to one people, and totally disregarded the specialness, the holiness of the city of Jerusalem to the Muslims and to the Christians. We recall the words of Jesus when he looked at the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and he wept over it and said, you don't know what makes for peace. I tried to offer some fundamental guidelines for the resolution of the Jerusalem, of Jerusalem as well as the whole conflict. And here I just would like to add another thing. I don't believe that the President of the United States, whoever that person is, has the right, the final word on Jerusalem. Because I believe the final word is for God. And the God we believe in is a God of justice and peace and the God who loves all people equally. In a nutshell, 
a political, the political conflict over the land of Palestine has to do with the biblical theology of land. How did Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul reinterpret the tradition regarding the land? What was their theology of land? This is very crucial, very crucial to us as Christians, the theology of land. I think you will find some stimulating words in the book to help you reflect on the theology of land. When you strip our three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, when you strip them to their basic core, what is the heart of religious faith in the 21st century? Again, this is included in the book. So I hope you will get the book in con conclusion of this first part. Palestinian liberation theology, my friends, believes that justice, the justice we seek and work for, has seven essential dimensions. Ideally, true justice needs to be linked to every one of these seven dimensions. Sari already mentioned two or three of them. Let me end this section with the seven dimensions of justice. Justice must be linked to love. When we love, we do justice. If we don't love, we do injustice. Justice must be linked to mercy. As Sari mentioned, justice on its own can be very harsh. It must be linked to mercy. And that's why always, as Sabil, as people working for justice, for liberation, Palestinian liberation theology, we always say, we want Israel to live in peace and security. But Israel has to do justice to the Palestinians. Without justice to the Palestinians, there will never be peace or security for Israel. Justice must be linked to truth. Justice must be linked to security. Justice must be linked to nonviolence. Justice must be linked to peace. And justice must be linked to reconciliation and forgiveness. I go into greater detail in the book over these seven dimensions of justice. So if you need to really find out, I hope I have stimulated your desire to buy the book. So, dear brothers and sisters, I challenge you to read the book and engage with us in the work for a just peace so that all the people of Palestine, Israel, can live in peace in security, and in human dignity. So this is the first part of my presentation. I would like us to turn uh, to the PowerPoint, and I would like to thank John Ross and Anne Dursey for helping me with reading the slides. So let us look now at the PowerPoint. I will make some comments. I know that some of you, um, how many of you, let me ask you, how many of you have visited Palestine, Israel? My goodness, wow, wonderful, wonderful. So some of you might find some of uh, what I will say as repetitious, but I hope many times repetitious is also a good thing. So. But those of you who have not and do not know, I hope, again, I will try to attract you more, to know more, to study more, and to come and visit. So I begin with the logo of Sabil. Sabil 
What's, what we started with by the grace of God was Palestinian liberation theology. I don't have time to go into how Palestinian liberation theology started, but you'll find it in the book. But, um, but then Sabil came into being. Sabil um, is, as mentioned, an ecumenical Palestinian Liberation Theology Center. The word Sabil, you see the Sabil in English, but under the Sabil in English is the way we write Sabil in Arabic. So this is, the cross is an Aleph, is Aleph, and then that's the way we write Sabil. And Sabil has two meanings. It means the way, the path. It also means a spring of water. The water is coming down, is coming, springing out from the foot of the cross on the way, on the way. So my friends, we are on a journey, journey. Walk with us the journey for justice, peace, and reconciliation. But please remember that the way we adopted this name, not because we just liked the word Sabir. If you read the book of Acts, you will find that the first name given to the followers of Jesus Christ before they were known as Christians in Antioch, that's where, where they adopted the word Christian. Before they were known as Christians, in Jerusalem, they were known as the people of the way. So, Sabil, we have captured, we reclaimed this word from our New Testament heritage. Okay, let's begin. Um, okay, next, yes. What is Zionism? In 1897, Zionism started as a nationalist movement among European Jews for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. Theodor Herzl, an Austrian-Hungarian Jew, a journalist and political activist from Vienna, is considered the founder. Thanks. On June 12, 1895, Herzl wrote in his diary, when we occupy the land, we must expropriate it gently. The pro we must expropriate gently the private property on the estates assigned to us. We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries while denying it any employment in our country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Now, look at this. Um, when Herzl wrote this, he, were, he was writing in a context of colonialism. So they thought they can go and colonize Palestine. But it turned out it was a settler colonialism. It was not just, there were many colonialists. Uh, many of the countries of Europe had colonies. But it was a different colonial adventure. Next. This is here, I could spend long time, but, and some of you probably have seen this, these four maps, but they tell the story of Palestine. So I'm, I'm going to try very quickly to try to help you understand this, because if you get it, you know the story of Palestine and what happened. Four maps. Begin with the left map. The green represents Palestinian people. And also, it represents or reflects their ownership of the land. So ma mainly green. The white stuff represents, in 1946, it represents Jewish presence, Zionist presence. But here, I must stop and make, put a footnote, very important footnote. In Palestine, we always had Jewish people with us. Before the Zionists came, we had Jews for many years. We had Christians for 2,000 years. We had Muslims since the 14th, for, since the, four, the 7th century. 
But in the 1900s, the Zionists were coming and they were changing the demography of Palestine. But even in the mid-1950s, still the Zionists owned less than 6% of the land of Palestine. Please remember, they owned less, less than 6% of Palestine. But after the Second World War and the tragedy of the Holocaust, there was pressure from the Zionists on the victorious powers, United States, France, Britain, uh, to, to hasten or speed up the giving of Palestine to the Zionists. And this, we, do, we don't have time, but because of the Balfour Declaration that was given to the Zionists in 1917, after the First World War. So, so the powers in the United Nations that, was, that has been invented recently, they decided that the best way they can is to partition Palestine. So listen to this. The minority people in Palestine were the Jewish people, the Zionists. They owned less than 6% of the land. They were given gratis 55% of the land. All the white stuff in the second map. The Palestinians immediately said, not fair. What about what President Wilson was talking about, self-determination? Why can't we have the self-determination? We are the majority. No. Other countries, other peoples had self-determination and they created their own countries, but not in Palestine because the powers United States and Britain had already promised the Zionists a home in Palestine. 55% and they left for that majority people, the Palestinians, 45%. But listen to this. The moment the United Nations accepted the partition plan, the Zionists immediately started pushing the Palestinians out of the 55%, but they were so successful, they did not, they did not stop with the 55%. They kept pushing the people out until they took 78% of Palestine. This is map number three. Look at the white. And the United Nations said, get back to your 55%. And the Zionists said, no. And America, United States, and Britain did not force Israel to get back. So what was left of Palestine? 22%. The West Bank, the Gaza Strip. In 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza, and now all of Palestine is under Jewish rule. And then they started building the settlements, map four, and this slide is a number of years before, so now list the next one. Look at the West Bank. All these dots are settled Jewish only. Israeli only settlements. And they're more than what you see here. And, um, and all of this is illegal under international law. This is the story of Palestine. This is the story of Palestine. Can you go back one? When the partition plan took place and the Zionists started pushing the Palestinians out 
This is when the Zionists came to my hometown. I was 11 years old. I remember very well the Zionists coming through town. Our house was on the main street of the town. They occupied us. We had no army to defend us. We had nothing. They just walked in. I was playing outside, and I watched the Zionist soldiers coming through town. A few days later, they gave us a military order. It's a long story, but I'm cutting it down. They gave us an order. You have two hours to get out of town. My father pleaded with the military governor. He said, I have nowhere to go. My father was a goldsmith, silversmith. He had bought a piece of land. He had built three houses on it. He had a great business around Bisan. Incidentally, Bisan is not mentioned by name in the New Testament, but it was part of the Decapolis, the 10 cities that you read about. Bisan was called Scythopolis during the time of Jesus. So we had no choice. He told my father, if you don't leave, we will kill you. And in the beginning, they told us that you'll have to walk out of town. How can you walk? You know, outside, where do you go? They told us to meet at the center of town. When we got to the center, they divided us into two groups. The Muslims on one side, Christians on the other. They took all the, all the Muslims down to the River Jordan, just a few miles, less than three miles down the river. And they told the Muslims, go to Jordan. They took all of us Christians and literally dumped us on the outskirts of Nazareth, the town of Nazareth, where Jesus was brought up. We became refugees. We lost everything. We lost everything. We were much better than many of the refugees because my father was able, I have seven sisters. He was able to smuggle out some of the gold. They hid it under their dresses. And so we were able to sell, my father was able to sell some of the gold in Nazareth and rent a shop and buy some tools and start his business again. So we were never, we did not go to camps. We, our church, the Episcopal Church, received us well. They, for, for, for immediately the schools closed down and we, we went into the Christ Church School in Nazareth and we, the Episcopal, the different Episcopal families that came out with us from Bisan and we occupied part of the school, you know, at a time in which we had nothing except the clothes on our back. This is the story of Palestine. What happened to us happened to thousands of families throughout Palestine. And three quarter of a million Palestinian refugees that either fled and couldn't go back to their homes or they were happened to us as only at gunpoint they were driven out from their homes never to go back. And the Israeli government, in order to prevent the Palestinian refugees from returning to their homes, it, it went and bulldozed around 500 villages and towns throughout Palestine. If you have time, you can Google. There are maps showing the villages that have been demolished by the Israelis. This is the story of Palestine, my friends. But most people in the West don't know that story because they were immediately immersed in the story of the Holocaust and what happened to the Jewish people. And Palestine was invisible to most people. Okay. 
Let's look at the Bible for a minute. How is the Bible being used today? Okay, let's back to Book of Numbers 33 verses 50 to 56. God said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Destroy all their figured stones, destroy all their cast images, and demolish all their high places. You shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. So this is one of the texts from the Bible that has been used by religious Jewish Zionist settlers and non-settlers. And we don't have time to look at it more carefully, but I think the mes its message is clear. Look at the second one now. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and when the Lord your God gives them seven nations over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them, and show them no mercy. I mean, very simple. The question is, do these two texts reflect the God that we have come to know in Jesus Christ? Do these texts reflect the love of God whom we have come to know in Jesus Christ? No. These texts come from a tribal, tribal understanding of God. As far as I'm concerned and in my research, such texts have no authority, no authority on us Christians. They have been repudiated within the Old Testament itself. I will show you now another text. But, my friends, these texts are being used to justify the expulsion of the Palestinians and the utterly destruction of the Palestinians. Unbelievable. See the next one. Book of Ezekiel 47, verses 21 through 23. So you shall divide this land among you according to the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who reside among you and have begotten children among you. They shall be to you as citizens of Israel. With you they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe aliens reside, there you shall assign them their inheritance, says the Lord God. Ezekiel is writing after the exile. He's a prophet of God. So he's writing after the exile. And he says to the people, he says, look, you've got to share the land. You've got to lift all of you together. Doesn't talk about expulsion. Doesn't talk about utterly destroying, destroying them. He says... God is saying to us, live with the people of the land and inherit. The word inheritance come in. It's a different theology. It's a different understanding of God. God, this God reflected in this text is a God who's open to all people. I don't, I don't consider myself an alien, but even if the Israelis see me as an alien, which they do, look what God is saying. You gotta live, you and all the people of the land. You inherit, you live together there. And such text critique the, the te those texts that we have seen before, they critique them and they reject them in that sense. It's very interesting. Next. What are the options for a peaceful solution? Number one, the two-state solution. 
is what UN resolutions and international law require. A Palestinian state on all the occupied territories that Israel conquered in the 1967 war. The state of Israel. Number two, one state. This is the ideal solution. Equal democracy for all citizens, Israelis and Palestinians. Thanks. What does Israel want? Number one. One sovereign Israeli state over the whole land. Number two, no sovereign Palestinian state, only home rule, a Bantustan, a vassalage for the isolated and disjointed Palestinian towns and villages. Next. Main obstacles to peace. Number one, the US has used its veto over 43 times to protect Israel from being condemned and censured by the UN Security Council for its violations of international law. Number two, the US Congress in both houses and in both parties gives blind support to Israel. Number three, the pro-Israel lobby is powerful in using intimidation and financial resources to effect change for Israel's benefit. Number four, American Christian Zionists and neocons give blind support to Israel. Next. Reasons for hope. <clears throat> Number one, our hope and trust is in the God of love, justice, and peace. Number two, injustice and oppression cannot have the last word. Three, American Jews of conscience are speaking out. Four, Jewish Voice for Peace, USA, Independent Jewish Voices, Canada, is very active. Five, younger generation of Jews are open to fairness and justice. Six, Jewish Israeli settler extremist actions are exposed. Seven, BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions, are working. United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, UN former Secretary General on January 30th, 2016. Ban called Israeli settlement activity an affront to the Palestinian people, and it is human nature to resist occupation. The status quo is untenable. Keeping another people under indefinite occupation undermines the security and the future of both Israelis and Palestinians. Professor Alon Ben Meyer, New York University Center for Global Affairs. He's a Jewish person. Quote, unless Israel embraces a new moral path, no one can prevent it from unraveling from within only to become a pariah state that has lost its soul. Israeli's occupation cannot be defended on moral grounds or in terms of national security. It is drowning in moral corruption that the continued occupation only deepens." End quote. Harry Siegman, a former national director of the American Jewish Congress. It, Israel, has crossed the threshold from the only democracy in the Middle East to the only apartheid regime in the Western world. Martin Luther King, Jr. Quote, the arch of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, end quote. Martin Luther King, Jr. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Jesus Christ continues to call us to do justice so that peace and security can be achieved for all the people of Palestine, Israel. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. My, my PowerPoint stops here, ends here, but I wanna go just one step further. If you, I, I have your Patience, just one moment. I hope so far 
the message is very clear. But that puts great responsibility on us all. Please, you are here living in Washington, D.C., very close to the politicians and to the people of Congress. If you believe, if you see, if you accept this presentation, it carries a responsibility for every one of us to do whatever we can. In spite of what President Trump has done, there is still a way to salvage the situation, I believe. I know it looks very dim, and many of our people see it as very dim. But I still hope that good people who are willing to take a stand for justice can do something. But I want to leave you with another note. This is the, the political. I want to leave you also on a spiritual note by looking at three more slides. So in the next one, please. Okay, this slide is quotes from Book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was sent by the Persian to Jerusalem to look after the, uh, the, the civic affairs of the people there. But he came into conflict with some of the people of the land, and this is what he told them about Jerusalem. Uh, so please read. Book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 20. Then I, Nehemiah, replied to them, the God of heaven is the one who will give us success, and we, his servants, are going to start building. But you have no share or claim or historic right in Jerusalem. Now, these are wor unbelievable words, but they reflect exactly what's happening back home, where Israel says that Jerusalem only belongs to the Jewish people. That Muslims and Christians have no share or claim or historic right, which is baloney. We know the history. We know history very well. Look at the history of Islam in Jerusalem. In fact, Islam have rough governed Jerusalem hundreds of years more than the, Jewish, the Jews governed Jerusalem. The Christians look at the history of Christianity in Jerusalem. No share, no claim. It's unbelievable. This exclusive theology was immediately critiqued by the psalmist, a psalmist, a brilliant psalmist. Look at it. Let's next, next one. Psalm 87. This is one of the most beautiful psalms. Listen very carefully, please, to this psalm, and I will say a few words about it in a minute. Psalm 87. On the holy mountain stands the city founded by the Lord. He loves the city of Jerusalem more than any other city in Israel. O oh, city of God, what glorious things are said of you. I will count Egypt and Babylon among those who know me, also Philistia and Tyre, and even distant Ethiopia. They have all become citizens of Jerusalem. Regarding Jerusalem, it will be said, everyone enjoys the rights of citizenship there, and the Most High will personally bless this city. When the Lord registers the nations, he will say, they have all become citizens of Jerusalem. The people will play flutes and sing. The source of my life springs from Jerusalem. It's an amazing text. Go back, please, to the, before it. Yeah. It pictures God standing at the entrance, at the gate of Jerusalem, welcoming people into the city. And God sees the Egyptians coming. The Egyptians 
in the Bible were always enemies of ancient Israel and Judah. But God tells the Egyptian enemies, he says, come in. You are citizens in Jerusalem. In one of the translation, it says, you are born in the city of Jerusalem. Come in. God sees the Babylonians coming in to Jerusalem. And God says, and these Babylonians were the ones who destroyed Jerusalem, according to the biblical text. But God says to these Babylonians, come in, you are citizens of Jerusalem. It belongs to you. You're born in it here. And God sees, go back. God sees the Philistia, Philistines. Philistines are not the Palestinians. These people came from the Greek Isles and lived in the west, western, western coast of Palestine. And God tells, and they're always been uh, against, uh, against their enemies of ancient Israel. And God tells the, the Philistines, come in to Jerusalem. You, so Jerusalem, according to God, is a city open to all, even our enemies. Not to mention the way Jerusalem has developed, evolved in history to become holy for the three monotheistic religions. And now all of a sudden it has been shrinking or forced to, be sh to shrink in order only to accommodate one religion and one country, one people. But then look more. Next one, yes. Look at it. Regarding Jerusalem, it will be said, everyone enjoys the rights of citizenship there. This is written after the exile by a poet. It's a poem. It's a psalm. And it's a beautiful psalm in the way it is describing that Jerusalem is an open city, an inclusive place, rather than an exclusive place. And look at the end. When God is registering all these people so that all of them are citizens of the Israel, then it ends with the people will play flutes and sing as if it is let us celebrate, let us celebrate the inclusiveness of Jerusalem. This is a note that I would like to end my few words to you. And I hope you will reflect, reflect on it. So thank you very much for this. And Sari, you want to? Uh, I, I, I hope we will have say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a gift. Such a gift to end on such a hopeful note tonight, something that we can pray for. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, give you an opportunity to interact with Naeem. This is where the message comes to life uh, when um, he's interacting with your questions and the things you're interested in learning about. Um, so what I'm going to do is set up this microphone on a stand right here. If you have questions, just come and line up, and you can, uh, we'll ask them in the order of, um, of how you are standing. And please, not everyone all at once. Thank you, Reverend and Dr. Atik. I'm Dan Beaupre, a member of St. John's. And um, since visiting the Holy Land just recently with Sari and others, um, I've been wondering how to engage with American Jewish friends. Yes. Um, I have several, and I'm to date very timid about talking about my impressions, even before I traveled to the Holy Land, but definitely since I've traveled to the Holy Land, um, I've struggled with how to engage and how to successfully communicate my deep concerns about our, uh, our, our, our government's 
policies and history in the region. And I'm looking for, for advice, I'm looking for, for thoughts, for counsel, if you or others could, could provide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I would say it's very important just to tell your experience, very simply. I don't think, I know, I know the problems back home and the difficulties, you know, because the difficulty is that most people are not changed by facts or by, by uh, quoting history or quoting uh, figures, you know, all this. And this issue is not only resolved, will be resolved uh, by just giving facts, because it, has, it touches the sentiment, touches the emotions. Most people are very emotional when it comes to, to Jerusalem and to the whole conflict. So I, my, my suggestion is just, just say to, tell them your, your story, your experiences, as simple as it is. And don't argue very much with them because it becomes a very emotional thing and you will lose friends. And there are people, and it's up to you. You know, I know many people want to stay silent because they don't, don't want to lose their, their precious friendship with these wonderful people. But at the same time, I think you will find some people who are willing to listen and ask them to go and visit, but not to go only and visit the Western part because many of the Jewish guides will take you. You will not see the wall. You will not see the injustice. You will not see the oppression of the Palestinian people. But ask them to go on a visit that will provide for them a much more open visit. There is nothing wrong by, by going and seeing also things inside Israel. We do that all the time. But they have to see what's happening to the Palestinian people on the West Bank. And we take people and show them. And I know that many Jewish people themselves are now working for justice. And that's why our partners are Jewish Voice for Peace in this country. So that's my, that's, that's my suggestion. Just tell them what you have seen as simply as you can do it and without trying to force it on them. They need to think about it. And I think I see that it's beginning to change slowly. I think Israel has reached the peak. And I think through our stories, I hope people will begin to reflect on it and I hope they will change. That's all that I can tell you. Um. First, I'd like to comment that oh, I'm really not very tall. <laughs> um, in case anyone hasn't been encouraged to buy the book, the Bible study that is in the book, I think, is a good roadmap for our lives, not just for the story of Israel-Palestine. I, th I found it very enriching. So I buy the book. <laughs> But my question is this, as I watched the news this week, I found it heartbreaking at how the news was reported back to us. And so there was not the scene of the thousands of marching with nonviolence. There was the constant image of a couple of youths throwing stones. And somehow that throwing of stones was equated to using snipers. Um, it seems that if we don't get, if we don't have our press informing us fully, it's not going to impact our Congress. It's not going to impact our government. 
it's not going to impact our fellow citizens. How can we get a better representation of the story across our country? Thank you. I think so far as, as I know, um, you don't get the news from the main media channels. You're not going to get it. Still, these people are not willing to, to give it. And there are all kinds of pressures maybe upon them uh, that they, are not, they will not do it. And so many people today are turning into the, into the computers, into the, uh, uh, you, can get, you can get the news through the uh, internet. And I think that's legitimate. And uh, when uh, Tarek comes, maybe he will mention some of, the, some of the media or some of the organizations that you can get in touch with and that can, can help you in getting uh, more news and more authentic news about what's really happening back home. So I leave it to, to, to Tarek to do that. Yeah, hi, I wonder um, what, you would, what you say to people, uh, Christians, who say that they don't want their religion to become just uh, more politics, and you know, that it's all about politics, and they, they try to love their neighbor you know, directly and not get involved in these sorts of disputes and uh, you know, discords. Yeah, well, when I, we are very much involved in politics, but we are not involved in, we, we don't touch uh, parties, pol political parties. That we don't touch. That's, so when I talk about politics, our politics is, is our life, everyday life. I'm not talking about parties, political parties. And we will not do that. You know, but when it comes to the politics of the area, the politics that's coming out, doesn't care, doesn't make any difference the, which party is the government. We're looking at what they are doing, what the, the, the regulations that they create, the, the laws that they are sponsoring, all of this. This is everyday politics, and we need, we have a voice in this as citizens. We need to speak out when the, when the government is doing things wrong, when the government is being corrupt, we need, we have, so that's what I, I feel it's very important to take a stand, you know. But I'm not talking at all about political parties. And there are many political parties back home, uh, not only here. In fact, here you don't have as, as many as we, we have back home. But we are very much involved because politics have to do with our life, with living under occupation living under injustice. And that, I think, we have as, as citizens, as people, people responsible under God. I think we need to take a stand and resist everything that is unjust. That's the way I would see it. Thank you for raising the question. I have a follow-up to Dan's question. As I've begun to tell my story to my very kind Jewish friends, I'm asked how I can align with the people that choose to align themselves with the terrorist organization. And I don't know how to respond to yes. that. I tell you, in that sense, again, I think you need to tell them that um, these terrorism is the way they would see it from their perspective. But these people have the right to resist non-violently. International law protects them. International law encourages them to stand. It's been, for the people in the West Bank, it's been 50 years. For the people of Gaza, it's been 70 years. Wow. So I know that, I know the excuses, I know the ra rationalizations, I know the justifications that many people, and I tell you, at the end of the day, the choice is, is yours. Because I know many people who 
took a stand for justice for what they have experienced, and they lost friends. They lost friends. And I know, you know, I don't know whether you've heard of, uh, of Mark Ellis. Mark Ellis is a Jewish liberation theologian. He has written a book on Jewish liberation theology. Uh, yeah. And there are many in this country, there are many organizations, clergy, especially clergy, who meet with other clergy and with Muslims and with Jews. But most of the time, when it comes to the issue of Palestine, the Jewish people, the rabbis, would say, we can talk about anything except Palestine. So Mark Ellis called this the ecumenical deal. The ecumenical deal. That is, you can have relationships with other people, ecumenically, interfaith with other people. But when it comes to, to Palestine, don't say anything. If you want us Jews to be there, don't say anything about Palestine. So by that, they have silenced the issue. I think we need to have the guts to speak out gently, as you mentioned, gently, but firmly. I have been there. I'm not anti-Semitic, because they will call you anti-Semitic. I've been there. I'm not anti-Semitic. I've seen the injustice. I've seen the oppression. Say it as gently as you can, but know you are risking the friendship at times. Just very quickly, I think your presentation is really powerful, especially in the light of everything that we've seen and heard for the last several days in this country. Um, I'm ashamed of my country. But one of the things that I think that everybody in this, everybody who's interested and everybody should tell all of their friends who are interested is the Jewish Voice for Peace, which you mentioned has a very active chapter in Washington, D.C. You sign up, you go to the website jvpdc.org, and um, they'll put you on your mailing list, and you get um, communications from them you know, every couple of days. They're really active, and they're very good, and it's a, it's a wedge in, I think. Thank you for this. And this may be, this is very helpful for the other questions that I, you, some of you have asked. Because try to find uh, literature that comes from Jewish Voice for Peace or from Beth Salem, um, so when you are talking to these friends and they, they think that you are wrong and you don't know what you're talking about, give them material that is, that is written not by Christians, it's written by Jews. And they're here in Washington, D.C. And it's available. Just give them, uh, find out the addresses of these and help them look it up, you know themselves and and listen to some of the some of their lectures they're amazing people they're amazing people I, I this is not a question I just I was uh, interested when you talked about the ecumenical deal and this is more of a testimony but there is a local rabbi um, that I've gotten to know and um, it's been really powerful that um, uh, uh, he reached out to me and said I'd like to put a weekly meeting on our calendars where we can get together and just start talking about Israel-Palestine. And uh, we've been doing this for weeks, and we record every session. And uh, we started just with the personal stories, you know, just talking about our own connection to the land. Um, I've learned a lot from him. I know he's learned a lot from me as well. Uh, but one of the things that um, we've said jokingly is that if we... Um, we, we like each other a lot, we care each other, we consider each other friends. We've done things. He's come to St. John's. Um, I've gone over there. Um, but one thing we joke around, we say, if we can't solve the conflict, he and I, there's no hope, right? Because there's such a connection between us, and we're so committed to figuring it out and talking about it. So I feel really hopeful from these conversations 
Um, and maybe kind of on a broader level is I, I feel hopeful that conversations like that are taking place. Uh, and I know they are. And um, maybe, maybe it is through authentic stories, like you're saying, sharing experiences. Um, facts don't convince people. It's the stories that do. And yeah. that's, those are, that's, that was Jesus' strategy also. Yes. You know, so. Yeah, I can, I can tell you a story that happened with me. A number of years ago, we had a conference uh, inter, uh, a regional conference in, uh, in uh, Detroit, uh, Sabil Conference, uh, Friends of Sabil Conference. And three rabbis wanted to talk to me. I did not know them. They just reached out and asked me if I can meet with them, but they said not publicly. So I told them I am willing to meet with them anywhere they want. So they chose a place, we met in a small coffee house, and uh, we started talking and opening up about the situation back home. After one and a half hours of discussion, I was very impressed by them. They were wonderful people, and believe me, we agreed on everything. We agreed on the analysis of what's happening back home, um, about the injustice, about the oppression. We agreed on what we need to do. I mean, we talked about the two-state solution at that time, and they agreed on it. It was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. At the end, I said to them, I said, look, I see that we are in agreement on the way we see what's happening. Would you mind inviting me to your synagogue so that I can share some of these points that we're talking about. And they looked at me. I think one of them was conservative rabbi and two were reform, reform rabbi. They looked at me and they said, if we invite you, we will lose our job. I still, it rings in my ear. So this is part of the difficulty. I have been, I have a very good friend rabbi friend in Chicago. And every now and then we see each other. And I was telling Rabbi Brent, Brent Rosen, I was telling him, how can you help me get into the synagogues? And he told me, he said, Naeem, it's very difficult. They will not allow it. So it's as if there are people who are making it very difficult to enter into the synagogue. And I believe if we can enter the synagogue, there are many Jewish people of conscience who will, who will be changed if they know what's happening there. But somehow, somebody, some people are holding, holding them, what's the word? Yes, yes. And this is the tragedy again. Just to follow up on that comment, it seems to me that, I'm sure many people are wondering, what can we do? And it seems to me that voices that come from within the Jewish community will open those doors. And one of the more encouraging things we see are things like Jewish Voice for Peace, or Beth Salem, or others who are speaking out from within the Jewish community. So we should be partnering, it seems to me, with those groups and helping to strengthen their efforts and the same thing in Israel. Voices need to be raised in Israel and Palestine from that community as well to open those doors. What do you think? No, I think, I think that's what needs to happen. I, but I believe because of the situation and the emotions back home, let's begin it here. I mean, let's... Well, we're here, so practically yeah, exactly. speaking. And, right. and, uh, and you have greater democracy than we have back home. So I think you, if you can, if begin, if the two people, uh, the Jewish Voice for Peace and other uh, conscientious people are heard and are very active with some of the Christians, maybe this movement will gather momentum and begin to affect people there. The problem here is that you have a very strong APAC, pro-Israel lobby, 
And again, they're very powerful here. And then you have the Christian Zionists who are so also very powerful. Um, so but, I think you need to do that. But your presentation said it's, it's not the fact that the bad people are speaking out, it's that the good people are that, being silent. So. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. It's like, John, it sounds like it's, it's you. Sorry about that. So not much is going on at the governmental level in trying to secure peace. But it would be heartening to think that there were meetings of civilians, ordinary citizens in Palestine and Israel, meeting constantly, talking to each other. But I worry that maybe nothing's going on. Is anything happening at that level? I tell you, what has happened recently, what, the, what uh, Trump has done, uh, has made it more difficult for these things to take place. So there are many people are more angry, you know, back home, and they, they cannot. There was a time way back when we were very much hopeful for a solution. Um, that the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians were um, going on all the time. Um, the Palestinians were meeting with the Israelis and vice versa, and we were very hopeful. Now, hardly anything is taking place. It's not taking place, and I think part of the tragedy here. So I hope we will revive it again, or you know, it will happen again, but it's very unlikely at this point because of the high emotions. You know, people are very, very angry for the United States to really close the door on Jerusalem, you know. But in spite of that, I still feel hopeful because nothing will happen unless the United Nations and international law would bless what the Americans have done. And the United Nations will never do it. I don't think so. Because what, what uh, Trump has done, it, it's just one person or one country. Uh, and I don't think it means that the whole world are going to bless what, Israel, what uh, the Americans have done. So I think we need to go back to the gas, grassroots. And we need to realize that this conflict is going to go on and we need to understand that it's, uh, it's go gonna go on for a longer time. But we need to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Thank you. And thank you again for all of you. I'd like to now um, introduce you to uh, just for the next few uh, minutes uh, to the executive director of FOSNA, which is the Friends of Sibyl North America, my friend Tarek Abata. Tarek, welcome. Thank you. Can I use that or? Um, you can use this one. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Reverend Naim, as he said, has been on the road for three weeks, about three of these presentations a day. Uh, the, have you turned, where is Reverend Naim? Have you turned 81 or? 81 years old, and so when I get tired after a week, I've only been with him on the U.S. part. I'm half his age, exactly, actually. I turned 40 in January. I will tell you this. Some of you will be ready to hear my message. I will take about seven minutes. And some of you will be ready to hear it 50 years from now. My message is about the praxis of the Palestinian liberation theology that Reverend Naim Atik has talked about and what Friends of Sabil North America has done about that. Tiny bit about my background, which you like, especially in a church setting. Grew up in Bethlehem to a mother named Maria and a father named Joseph, who is a carpenter. <laughs> if anybody's more qualified to speak on prophetic action from this pulpit, come on forth. <laughs> When Sari talked about building meaningful community and making a difference globally, we got to get our hands dirty in order to do these things. Dirty meaning not just theology from the ivory towers, but theology in the streets. 
And what does that theology in the streets look like in our churches? Does anybody recall or know what Edmund Pettus Bridge is? Selma. Selma. Edmund Pettus Bridge was named after a grand dragon of the KKK. Now, it is now remembered as a site of conflict which is called Bloody Sunday in March 1965 as civil rights movement demonstrators were marching to Montgomery in support of voting rights. The bridge was declared a national monument in 2013, 50 years later. At the time, some churches and some persons like yourselves were ready to march out of the pews, out of the pews, and onto the bridge. And some were only ready to recognize the bridge as a national monument 50 years later. So when I ask today, are you as a Christian person ready to walk on that bridge of justice or are your children going to remember it as a monument? Because today Gaza and justice in Palestine is the Edmund Pettus Bridge of our day. And frankly, the past two days with the Gaza murders, the appalling silence of a lot of our churches has been deafening. The media has covered, as Reverend Naeem has said, this is the first time in his many years of activism that he had gotten so many radio interviews and a TV interview that he and I did in Pittsburgh with the Chris Moore um, uh, interviewer. That's wonderful that we have moved into these spaces as a Palestinian justice movement, but we are not there yet. We talk about, and people shame the movement of boycott, divestment, sanctions. Now, when I refer to Israel-Palestine, I never refer to it as a conflict, to be honest with you. It is not a conflict for me when the sixth largest military in the world is occupying five million people. It is not a conflict when you have a hundred Israeli snipers who have shot 60 plus Palestinians in two days and injured 2,700 people. That is an occupation, that is an oppression. I'd like you to consider some of our programs and to sign up to be a member with FOSNA as to be able to walk hand in hand over the Edmund Pettus Bridge today, not tomorrow, not 50 years from now. When we talk about BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions, and Sabil and Reverend Naim says this, before the Palestinian call for BDS, Sabil asked the world to take economic measures, not as a punishment of Israel, not as a punishment of Israel. BDS is part of nonviolence tactics that Martin Luther King talked, out, talked about and preached on and practiced. BDS belongs in the steps that I taught um, nonviolence curriculum to Palestinian students in the colleges. I was trained under a protege of Martin Luther King. His name is Bernard Lafayette. He teaches at Emory University in Atlanta. And the steps are information gathering, education, negotiations, direct action, reconciliation. Why I mention this is because negotiations have failed over and over and over when you have an oppression and an occupation. And as such, we don't want to punish Israel. We want to have these economic measures as the black community done in this country and as the black Africans did in their country to equal the power, to equal the negotiations table. So we would get that man's foot off our neck and we would sit together on the same table to negotiate our, we will not negotiate our human rights, but we will demand our human rights on that table. This is where you get the beloved community. Reverend Naeem talks about nonviolence tactics. The Gazans have been mostly and largely practicing nonviolence tactics. And we continue to practice nonviolence tactics. I would ask you to consider the following. How many of here in here go to a church how many regularly attend church service? Wonderful. One program is HP Free Church. Why? HP, as I, a Palestinian, as other Palestinians, go through checkpoints. We are monitored by Hewler Packard on the ground at these checkpoints. Every time we cross a checkpoint, do people know what I mean when I say a checkpoint? Okay, good. This is 201 then, not 101 or 001. 
When we cross these checkpoints, Motorola and Hewler Packard, just as Polaroid was involved in South Africa with the security apparatus, are monitoring our movements and are oppressing us on a daily basis. It doesn't take much for a church to say, I will not participate in such oppression. I will become an HP free church, which doesn't mean you have to throw away your equipment. It just means I will no longer participate in buying further equipment from this company. The denominational support. Sadly, the Episcopalian church is behind on divesting from companies that profit from Israel's occupation. Many mainline denominations that we've worked with have passed these resolutions and have moved forward, Marin, UCC. We have other, but how many have visited Palestine? A lot of you, wonderful. And that's probably why you're here and why you're active in the movement. And we encourage those who haven't, and I know in Saturday's church, many have, I think, three trips so far. And I bet you are changed when you meet people and you talk to them and your heart is changed on the ground. Education resources and seminaries. We can no longer afford not to teach Reverend Naim's books and other Palestinian liberation theologians. Why don't our books belong on these seminary shelves? They should. And we are looking at introducing them to 15 seminaries where we have connections with in the next couple of years. And we are looking at taking seminarians and funding their trips to go to Palestine. We already have a scholarship fund of $20,000 and we'll give each seminarian up to $2,000 to go and see. We have a FOSNA activist network, which a few of you are, belong to. And it's 130 people nationally who are participating in these programs. And lastly, the Clergy and Seminary Action Council. This is what we like to call the coming out support group for Palestinian rights. When you come out in support of justice and Palestinians, you might get some flack. And we've heard about it from a couple of people who ask questions. And the Clergy and Seminary Action Council is for, the, um, for those clergy who, for example, you have a conference on Palestine and you're being hit hard by Zionist community. How do you deal with that? How do you try to salvage your relationship with that Jewish community and become part of a larger beloved community? We have these clergy offering advice to those clergy who, who are going through that experience. They also sign on to, whether we like it or not, whatever church, you know, separation of church and, um, what do we say, separation of church and uh, state, thank you. However much we like that, and, and of course I'm in favor of it, when we have 130 clergy sign on to statements in support of justice, our legislatures pay attention to that because the clergy continue to be a moral voice in our community. So that is important. So what I'm asking you today is to participate in these programs. If you have signed that list, we will send you some information about these programs. You can, you can sign on to there. And we have a membership card $12 or more, you will become part of the movement in walking the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I want it to happen today, and I, want, I will keep preaching to, till I'm 81, hopefully, inshallah, about Palestinian rights. Hopefully we've gotten by then, uh, or we, we walk the bridge by then, but we will continue this message. So I am asking you to join that movement. And it's a part of a larger Christian movement, not just for Palestine, because we all work right now in coalitions, movement for black lives, immigrants' rights, Latino rights, all of these are coalitions that we're working with nowadays. So you are a part of a larger Christian movement that we want to take hold in all 50 states, slowly but surely, surely thank God. I thank you for welcoming me here, for accepting our message, and for Reverend Naim, whom I stand on his shoulders, hopefully not too heavily, and a man who has changed my life. In 20 years ago, I was reading his books in law school. I started out my um, journey as a lawyer, and that took just one year when I started working for grassroots organizing. And that's thanks, uh, thanks largely to Reverend Naim Atik and Edward Said. That's how I changed my life. I ask you to change your life, to change your church's life, and to change our community's life by belonging to FASNA. Thank you. Amen. Friends, um, on our way out, the books are here. If you feel moved to um, make a contribution to FOSNA, uh, you can do that there. I'd like to invite us to please stand now and close tonight's program with a prayer.
Loving God, we're mindful that most things that are truly valuable in life don't come free. And we're mindful, God, that you invite us to participate in the work of those things that um, bring change and that make a difference. And we thank you for inviting us to be participants. And so tonight as we listen to a message and continue to try to comprehend the very complicated situation in Israel-Palestine and As we make ourselves mindful of people's emotions on um, both aisles of the conflict and everyone else stuck in the middle, we ask God for your help, that you would enlarge our hearts, make us a compassionate people. Give us the tools emotionally to deal with the frustration and the anger um, and at the same time not to forget the humanity of our brothers and sisters who believe different things than we do. We ask God for um, your close presence and your nearness and your healing upon everyone who has experienced loss because of the conflict and the struggle in Israel-Palestine because of the occupation. And we stand in solidarity today with those who are weakest and most desperately in need of support and advocacy. Bless us as we go from this place tonight, and we ask that you encourage our hearts, and thank you for the seeds that you've planted here tonight. May they continue to grow and uh, grow into what they need to be for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of peace and justice and mercy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.